specific uh, time warnings? Uh, like 10 minutes um, in the end, five minutes before the end? Yeah, probably 10 for me. 10 and 5? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Five is probably fine. Okay, we'll five. But I will say, I'll be there. 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 I'll be There's someone that's, oh, I guess that's just running in the back, right? Yeah. All right. It's always having bad, having the lunch after the, uh, the talk after the lunch. Yeah. Either everyone's uh, sleepy or still eating. Yeah, I don't know if it, uh, after or right before lunch, which one is the worst, but... <laughs> be beer in the talk. <laughs> I wish I could give it out too, but yeah. I think the university frowns upon unregulated distribution of <laughs> Sure, we can start and then people can right. filter in. Um, sure. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Aaron Aldridge. Aaron, Ald uh, Aaron Aldridge. Uh, Aaron is a community builder at Elastic and a founding organizer of the DevOps CT Meetup at DevOps Days Hartford 2017, so he's in Connecticut. <laughs> he is passionate for connecting humans and using technology to enhance our natural inclination to connect with each other. And there are references this where you can find the crazy, <laughs> crazy on Twitter. Crazy. I'll revisit those too. <laughs> uh, his talk today is Cores to Craft Building Code Community. And with that, we'll go ahead. Hi. Uh, so yeah, that was one title, and I, I've also called, oh, there's another, called this uh, talk Craft as in Beer to kind of play on uh, some of the phraseology you're probably familiar with from free and open source software. Um, pointer wasn't on. Uh, so that's where you can actually spell how to find me uh, for email or Twitter. Um, I'd love to connect about this talk on Twitter because this is an idea I kind of was passing around and um, I, I, I wanted to get some feedback on it. So I'd love for people to connect or like mention me in the middle of the talk if you're like, oh, I have a thought about that. Like that's totally cool too. Um, so for some level setting, I want to talk about free software. It's kind of where I borrowed that craft as in beer uh, terminology from. And uh, I didn't realize how much Red Hat presence there would be, so I probably don't have to be as detailed uh, in this part of the conversation as I might have to otherwise. Um, but I want to go through it a little bit just so at least we're all on the same point and, and same uh, understanding of the past here. Um, so in the beginning, uh, software wasn't covered by copyright at all because largely it's hard to copyright like the order of holes on a card, um, and like computers looked a lot different then too. So it wasn't really a concern uh, until the mid '70s. Contu, the government agency whose name I forget but remember the abbreviation, uh, argued that basically as far as software represents the original thoughts of the author, it should be covered under copyright laws. And by 1980s, it is actually defined and added to the existing copyright in the US. 
Um, and for those uh, who know the history, recognize that about 1983, that finally bothers Richard Stallman and left to leave the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab and form the Free Software Foundation. Um, basically, at this point, copyright exists in the way the licenses are written, uh, so restrictive that even if you wanted to share something like in MIT with another department, you might not be allowed to share the code between each other. Um, you can't really make improvements to it now because it's re restricted. Uh, and we're still at the very early ages of computers, so there's a lot to change and improve upon on a daily basis. Um, and, and basically, that's the, the gist of it, right? Like, we are always taught growing up that you should share. Like, if you've got knowledge or a tool that can help someone out, you should share that with them. But growing up, you're not told, hey, I'm sorry, you can't let someone else play with your toy because they haven't actually bought the license for that toy, so they're not allowed to use it, right? Like, that's not how society works. Uh, so it didn't make sense that this is applying to software, too. Um, we have to have a giant picture of Richard Stallman if we talk about free software. I think that's part of the GPL license. Um, so to go over briefly the four freedoms, you might know, but to refresh, uh, it's freedom to run the programs how you want, so you're not restricted to an operating system or a way to actually use the program. Uh, you should be free to study and change how the program functions, which is pretty much means access to source code is a prerequisite for that. Uh, so source code is going to have to be available so you can see how the program functions and alter it if you want to. Uh, freedom to redistribute copies. If I say, hey, I know you're having the same problem as me. This is the software that worked. How about you try it? Like That's part of free software. Uh, and the free to redistribute modified versions. Yeah, I had that bug too. Here's my fix. Try it out. It'll probably work for you. Right? That's all the basic freedoms of free software. Um, so, of course, that's a GNU. Uh, Richard Stallman forms GNU, starts trying to write the first open operating system, because uh, there isn't one at this point. All the operating systems have to be licensed. Um, and partially successful, built a lot of the major tools that make up an operating system. Um, but the more interesting portion that came out of that was copyleft and the actual legal frameworks for how to have free software. Uh, the problem with just releasing software public domain without copyright is that someone else can then change it and copyright that. And then you lose all those fixes and you lose that connection to the community there. Um, so the actual licensing that came along, the GNU GPL, is what's really important to come out of the beginning of that project. That's what enables all of the future growth of um, open source and free software. Um, we do eventually get a kernel that's open source, and Linus Torvalds releases in 90s, 1990, uh, the Linux kernel, and you get the GNU slash Linux operating system using tools from both uh, departments. Um, what was actually the interesting fact I found here was um, in listening to them talk about it, GNU was trying to build this micro kernel structure, very Unix thought. Each program does a different thing. And Linux beat them to the punch mostly because they built a monolith. So interesting conversation as you think about how we talk about like microservices and monoliths today. Just thought it was interesting. Um, adoption grows pretty rapidly of Linux. Um, these were numbers from Forbes, but you can see pretty much as internet ubiquity goes up, so does adoption of open source and Linux, because um, that's where largely the community lives that wants to use computers. Um, it's a lamp stack. So <laughs> <laughs> Linux basically takes over the web. It becomes kind of the de facto way to run websites, uh, especially if you're something like GeoCities and you've got a bunch of customers that want to run a bunch of websites. Uh, and Microsoft and IIS only runs one website per box at this point. It becomes more cost effective to run a bunch of Apache servers than a bunch of Windows servers and IIS. Um, today, that's pretty much what Linux adoption looks like on the web. 97% of the top 1 million domains are run on some form of Linux. 92% of all EC2 instances are some form of Linux. Uh, so pretty successful model as far as just adoption of the software. Um, so you, how many people have read or know of the Cathedral and the Bazaar essay? So most people, cool. Um, so you kind of know the gist. Um, 
lost his name. Eric Raymond, right? Uh, so Eric Raymond writes the Cathedral and the Bar Bazaar to compare the two existing software development models. The Cathedral is very much the current proprietary. Uh, there's not a lot of say from the community, but they work on it, and then eventually it's released to the public, and people can partake on it. Really long feedback cycles, um, and not really taking outside input. Uh, meanwhile, the bazaar, while it can be a little bit chaotic and messy, is constantly changing and getting feedback both from the users and the people that are working and maintaining and using that software. Everything iterates very quickly. Um, it's interesting to note that it's not that one is necessarily better than the other, but they produce different things and they look different. Um, everyone remember this logo? <laughs> so another successful move there is uh, in the 2000s, of course, Netscape Communicator has a problem. Uh, Anti-competitive practices and philosophy aside, they can't make money when 92% of the web is browsed by Internet Explorer given away for free. Uh, so taking inspiration from the open models in general, and the Cathedral and Bazaar essays, they decide to open their source code and invite the community to take part in the actual build process, which forms the Mozilla Foundation. Uh, so the Mozilla Foundation forms, and eventually, of course, release Firefox as the big first open source, wildly successful browser. Um, so that's really cool and shows how you can have success with this open model. But what's really interesting about it is where all that success comes from. It's not just because it's free, as in you give it away, um, but it invites the community to be part of that software development process. You're actually going out and saying, hey, is this useful for you? Do you want to help me make it better? Uh, and you start getting things like hackathons, where people use all this free and open source software and start sharing tools to solve real problems in their communities, whether civically or niche interest. Um, you have a lot of mentorship that builds up inside this open source community. You have meetups. They had install parties because we didn't have an official support source. So the community turned to itself and said, hey, I, I want to get started. How do I get started? And you'd have the experienced members come and help people just install free and open source software. How can I help you run it? So that largely drives the success of this whole format. There had to be people to support the open source movement. And we, of course, can say it's successful because free is in beer. Um, but that's kind of problematic in that it's talking about giving it away, but that's not really the exciting part about it. Besides, if I say free beer, uh, you're probably not expecting to get like a bunch of Trillium or Treehouse given out to you. You're probably expecting like a bunch of Budweiser. Um, so there's kind of this connotation that if it's free given away, it's probably not the best quality. Um, and it's not even that apt of an analogy anyway. It's usually more free as in puppies. Like here you can have it for free, but there is some care and feeding and maintenance you're going to have to do. Uh, so it's probably going to cost you something, if not upfront. Um, so again, not really compelling except for the part that we're talking freedom of the software. Free is in speech. It has certain rights associated with it uh, that lets you use that software how you want, in your own manner, without being dictated by uh, a company. Um, so if I were really clever, I could come up with some like, all right, free as in speech, free as in puppies, free as in beer, free as in some other thing, and we could have some cool freedom discussion. Um, but I got distracted by the beer portion, so we'll have a beer discussion. Uh, so craft beer is really interesting. I want to do a little bit of a history run through here as well. Uh, in 1887, there's over 2,000 breweries in the US. Those who know US history know there's a problem in about 30 years. Now there are officially zero breweries in the United States uh, because it's now illegal to brew and distribute alcohol. Uh, it ends in the 30s and World War II happens. So by the time we're really building up this industry again, it's a vastly different world that they're building it up in. Uh, a lot of the tradition is gone. Suddenly you can start shipping things nationwide. You can start advertising nationwide very easily. Uh, so the popularity comes from beers that are consistent. I can get the same beer in Boston as in LA, and it's going to taste the same. I'm advertised to. They're largely just generally appealing, not like dangerously niche flavors. So it's pretty much the least offensive things start spreading. Uh, by the late 70s, which is now as far from prohibition as we were before, there's only about 44 breweries in the US. So a far cry from 2000, even if that's underestimated. 
Um, and that's mostly because homebrewing is still legal. So 1978, homebrewing becomes legal again. In the 1980s, there are roughly eight craft breweries. Um, so we want to define craft beer a little bit. So we'll go through what actually is craft beer. Uh, they're small, so they have less than 3% of the total like barrel production in the US. Uh, independent, meaning they're not also owned by a company that has more than 3% of the barrel production. Uh, and traditional, so they care a lot about where beer came from. The flavors still come from the brewing and fermentation process. It's not some completely off the wall artificial alcoholic beverage. Um, so like Mike's Hard Lemonade doesn't count as beer. Uh, so that's kind of how they're trying to lock that definition with traditional. So you might recognize some of the early brewers from the 80s. These are all the craft beer companies that existed around that time. Uh, Anchor has a, a great history, like they're part of craft beer legend, because uh, they almost disappeared in the mid 60s. Got purchased, had to kind of modernize their whole infrastructure. Released actually the first American IPA considered come out of Anchor. Uh, and so by the 80s, they're pretty much up and running as one of these local breweries that could still stand. Um, and purchased largely because uh, Fritz Maytag didn't want to see his favorite beer go away, so he bought the company. Uh, New Albion was one of the first ones where a uh, home brewer turned business owner, only around for six years, but largely inspirational for every home brewer who said, I bet I could sell this. Uh, and of course, Sierra Nevada is still around today and largely responsible for the quality of hops that are available to home brewers and microbreweries. Did you say Fritz Maytag? Yeah, for. Uh, Did you say Fritz Maytag? Yeah, bought Anchor in the 60s. The Maytag Maytag? I don't know. Oh, I know okay. the name, I but I know it's the beer Maytag. I don't know if it's Maytag. Oh, okay, Maytag. very good. Um, so, yeah, Jack McAuliffe was New Albion, who was only around for six years. They've come back a couple times. Uh, and uh, Ken Grossman is, is uh, Sierra Nevada. Um, largely, the 90s come along, and we have sort of getting a little bit more adventurous. Sam Adams is proving that even a smaller brewer can show up in your sports bar. Um, they don't have to be like some niche thing that you have to know about. Uh, we're getting a lot of different flavors. Uh, Stone believes we should use all of the hops always. Uh, Allagash is bringing over all these Belgian styles. So uh, Blue Moon pretty much wouldn't exist if Allagash didn't brew Allagash White in the 90s. Uh, and obviously, we've got some of the major staples for today from Treehouse and Trillium kind of pushing the edge of what you can do with beer, uh, Oscar Blues, who made cans cool again, uh, and other things going on as well. Uh, pretty much the statistic is you're probably within about 10 kilometers of a brewery. <laughs> this is uh, not quite the smallest state in the US, uh, but where I live, and that's all of the craft brewers in Connecticut at this point. Yeah, so it's um, pretty popular. Uh, in fact, you can see there's quite a few compared to eight from 1980. There's now over 6,300 uh, operating in 2018. Uh, and what's really interesting is the way it sort of follows this dot-com boom and bust. If you watch it, it grows through the 90s. It kind of plateaus at the end and then jumps up again when 2010 comes around. Uh, so. Again, the economic success is interesting, but isn't what's really compelling about the story, just like free software. Um, so I want to tell a couple stories to sort of get at what's really interesting about craft beer. Uh, does anyone know Smutty Nose? They're relatively close by. Um, so the great story about this is the owner of Smutty Nose bought it by accident. Uh, he was currently and still is the owner of uh, Portsmouth Brewing Company, the brew pub in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And I, I forget the name, but some other brewer owned the location and the materials from Smutty Nose and went out of business, and it was up for auction. Uh, so he came by not just to buy it because he needed equipment, but he wanted to be there and welcome whoever bought this into the craft beer community. Like, hey, welcome. What can I do to help you out? Do you need information? How can we help each other? And of course, if you're at an auction, you throw in a lowball bid anyway, because why not? Uh, and then he won. So he suddenly was faced with, oh no, I need a company and beers to brew, uh, because I already have one, so I need to go reinvent all these recipes. 
Um, they're able to do all that. As you know, they're around. But the, the, the kind of the cool thing is they relied on the community to help them build this company that they weren't expecting to have to build. Uh, all the labels that come are pictures of people in the local Portsmouth community. They use a local photographer to take them. Uh, the original old brown dog is one of the brewery employee's dog at the time that posed for the photo and they took a picture of. Um, so it's really cool. They really gave back and made sure the community was part of their actual um, growth of their company. So Booth Bay Craft Brewery, you might not know about. They're a bit further away, and I don't think they distribute much outside of their area. Um, but I visited them a number of years ago, and uh, they had a really great story about what they were doing. They hadn't finished yet, so now I get to tell this whole thing now that they're done. Um, when they started out, they wanted to do... Um, their first beer about Booth Bay, right? Kind of established themselves there. So they gave out hops to the locals in Booth Bay, all the community that were part of that. And they had them grow them throughout the growing season. And harvest season invited everyone back for a big picnic and party and beer and food and harvested all the hops that the community had grown. Uh, so they actually used these hops to brew their first pale ale. Uh, it happens to be 6.33% ABV, which is like the area code for Booth Bay. So so they obviously name it 633 and release this community collaboration beer. Like the whole community actually got together to brew this beer. Um, but they didn't just want a brewery. They wanted to build a brew pub and a true public house that was a part of the community, like where you go to talk about what are our civic matters, what are matters of our community that we need to fix. Uh, so they started building this, this brew pub and uh, asking you know, the craft beer community for support. And uh, companies like Dogfish Head and Allagash actually sent them lumber to help build this big, you know, I mean, you can, you can tell it's all the hardwood post and beam construction that they build this out of. So they have lumber that's carved with like the Dogfish Head logo and the Allagash logo. Uh, and the community started donating that too, and they carved their names and location from where all this lumber came from to build this brew pub. Uh, now it's completed, and it's, you can tell it's not just for people who like craft beer, but their families can come in, bring their kids, and they can be part of the whole experience that's there. They become that gathering place for the community. Uh, and then one more is about a beer store. So they're not a brew pub, but they sell beer. Uh, so City Beer is in San Francisco. And when the owners opened it, everyone said, you can't sell just beer. There's no way. You're going to end up adding wine. You're going to add spirits. Like You're probably not just going to sell beer out of the store. Uh, but they tried anyway. And uh, it's, it's set up kind of like the idea of those wine bars where you can taste wine and then buy it and bring it home kind of idea. Uh, so not only were they successful because craft beer becomes successful and everyone comes and hangs out there, um, but when people would come, they'd bring friends who might not drink beer. And they could get in that situation. They'd say, hey, do you have, do you have any wine? And they'd say no, and that could be the end of it. Um, but they would start saying, hey, but what, what do you like to drink? Like, what's your favorite wine? And they'd describe, you know, I like a, a Merlot, whatever it is. They say, awesome, what do you like about the Merlot? Like, what's interesting to you about that that makes you come back and drink it again? And they describe, you know, maybe the flavors that they like about it or whatever cool wine words, mouthfeel, that's probably one of them. Um, and they say, awesome, you know, I, when you describe that, I think of this particular beer. Do you want to try it and just see? I know you don't normally drink beer, but do you want to try it? Um, and more often than not, they'd have someone like it and say, you know, I'm so glad you didn't have wine here, because if you did, I would have just drunk that and not known about this new thing. Um, but because you didn't have it, I tried something new and discovered this whole community that I can now become a part of. Uh, so just by including people that normally would be outside that community and say, hey, do you want to try and see if you like this? They got a lot more people to join and grew their local following. Um, so how does this all tie in? Is I want to maybe coin a phrase called craft software. Um, it's a little bit hard to define as either free and open or measured as small um, because it's really hard to measure the output of software. Like, do you have less than 3% of the total barrels of code that are output is kind of a weird measurement to figure that out. Um, and I fully understand there's some balance between being able to give away your code and needing to like put food on the table. Um, so it seems unfair to exclude people that want to charge for their work. I, I understand that. 
And for some companies, like for many beer brewers, their code or their recipe is what makes, sets them apart. That's what makes them different than their competition. Uh, so I had some ideas I wanted to wrap around this, and I thought it was more interesting to get at uh, the heart of what really drives both of these two industries of free software and craft beer, rather than what defines the edges of who qualifies. Um, so I think if you're doing craft software, you're building it with passion. It's not because you need to hit a quota or write a certain number of lines of code to get your paycheck at the end of the day, but you're doing it because you really love to do it. You're doing it because you solve something you care about, you're proud of your work, and you care about its impact that it has on other people and the community it's released into. Uh, I think there's an innovative tradition there, which is sort of picking up ideas of the past, paying respects to where they come from, and seeing what else we can do with those, maybe turning them over in a new light. Like this talk, for instance, is not whole cloth grown, but built on the shoulders of all the past of free software and all the past of craft beer, putting those together, turning it over a little bit differently, and coming up with something interesting. You know, even our software development movements like DevOps isn't wholly new. It's kind of looking at where open source came from and where Agile is going and saying, how can we apply this to operations and does this apply back now to development? Uh, openness and sharing, I think, is characteristic. And while I want to say you probably should open source everything you can, it doesn't mean you have to open source the whole company. Um, companies like Netflix and Twitter open source tools they use that aren't what set them apart necessarily from the competition, but are ways they found, hey, we started doing this practice, and we found it really helped us. Maybe this can help you, too. And they talk about it on stages, and they go to meetups, and they open source Chaos Monkey or other things things that aren't their secret sauce, but help other people get better at what they do. Uh, and I think the community is big. I think that's the biggest part is that the community has to be involved in it in some way. They're invited into the production process of your software. Um, whether it's, again, through you get to be an open source company and you can just fully say, come and help us build this, uh, or it's that tight connection of um, how is this working for you? Can we do something to improve it? Or it's even looking at a community outside the context of your product and saying, Hey, we're in Denver or we're in Boston. What's happening in Boston that we need to care about that we can give back to? Is there other things happening that we can help our community? Because we're bringing in venture capital. Like, how can we give back? Um, so that's sort of the four hallmarks, I think, that define what I was thinking of, of craft software. Um, I'd love to hear some feedback on that. Uh, so I don't know, I, don't, I have a little bit of time, I think, right? Um, so if anyone has questions or thoughts, I'd love to hear them now. And if not, I'll throw up my contact information again. So yeah, we got a microphone coming to you. Thank you. Uh, first, let me say a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And thank, thank you. you for the analogy that you use between craft beer and uh, software. So let me self-identify. I am not a developer. Okay. I head up a nonprofit. I came here because I want to be more informed <laughs> and learn about the community so that I can ask common sense questions of my webmaster and so but thank you for the wonderful presentation yeah. a question that I have and I, I applaud the community for what you've created I, I think that it would be great if other industries followed what you're doing it would be especially the financial community financial and the educational community so my question goes to your last point about community involvement. Yeah. Because it's not new to the community that it's lacking a little bit of diversity in terms of women and people of color. So my question, and I will also preface it with a quote by Albert Einstein. So my question is, how do you think the community is addressing it? at the root, the, the, the root of having more diversity, specifically women and men of color, 
or people of color, I'm sorry, people of color. And I would preface it also with a really powerful quote by Einstein who said, you cannot solve a problem with the same consciousness that created it. Right. You must stand on a higher ground. I have some ideas of solutions, but I would like to hear from this wonderful group of people who are attending here in this particular workshop, and I'd like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to end up giving a famous answer for the company I work for, too, and say it depends. Um, <laughs> which means it's a, I think it's a really good but really complicated question, and there's no easy answer for me to say, oh, it's addressed this way. Uh, I think part of it depends on what you consider the root of the issues, uh, and part of it depends on which communities you're looking at and how they're addressing it. Um, I can only speak for where I've been involved. Part of it for uh, our DevOps days, and actually DevOps days everywhere for the most part, uh, are explicitly required to have codes of conduct, and they're usually explicitly inclusive or aggressively inclusive, uh, meaning they make it a point to reach out and invite people in, not just, hey, we're here if you want to join, but we really want you to be here. Would you please be a part of our community? And we're going to try, we're going to make sure that it's a safe place for you to be, that it's not going to be invited in as an afterthought and then ignored once you're here. It's, it's about the inclusion, not just the diversity of attendance. Um, I've seen a lot of tech conferences do a lot better as far as it, it, some of it's just being conscious about it. So in the past, you might set up a conference panel or a speaker list, and it's just whoever submitted, and you selected what you thought was good. I've seen a lot more conscious effort in making sure people see themselves represented at conferences as well, that you can be part of that community. Um, I'd love if anyone else has other things they've experienced, maybe, or other ideas, then I would love to hear that, too. Uh, just to follow on his uh, comment, this conference has a code of conduct, so and it is rigorously enforced, uh, enforced and there is a staff that is dedicated to responding to code of conduct complaints. Yeah. So there is a conscious effort on the part of companies and developer conferences to at least respond in a responsible way to the various pressures and, and, and problems that have occurred over time. Yeah, I just wanted to mention one specific thing. Are you aware of Outreachy? I just heard that. Yeah, because that's a specific thing that was created in response to these kind of concerns. So that's one thing that is being done that Red Hat is involved with. So just wanted to mention that one. I appreciate crowdsourcing an answer and a talk about community, too. It's perfect. <laughs> so I think it's important to uh, not get caught up in solving the problem immediately. Uh, mm. Especially for a problem like this, it's not going to be like an overnight solution. Um, if you apply the agile method uh, of software development, it's all about iterative Im improvement. So you make tiny changes that get you closer to your, your goal. So every time you get feedback, for example, from your community saying, well, you didn't include enough uh, uh, diversity in this last conference or whatnot or the last activity, you take that and analyze it and make effort the next time you do it to uh, reach out and include those people that may have been uh, underrepresented. Um, yeah. Yeah. So part of it um, is helping to, you know, some of the concepts for development and innovation of, you know, not thinking of uh, failure as something you need to defend, but as a lesson to be learned, I think is a big way to apply that to your community development as well. When you get that feedback of it wasn't whatever it was, not an averse enough panel, um, instead of jumping on the defensive, you can turn towards that, you know, thank you for that feedback. How can we improve? Do you have ideas that can help us? If not, let's see what we can do and iterate on this for, uh, for next time. Do you have a question as well? With regards to inclusion, um, I'm, uh, I've been part of a group organizing computer events in Norway, uh, where we had traditionally about 5% female attendees, uh, and our goal was 25%. Uh, yeah. And we said, okay, we'll reach this within seven years. Uh, so we got quite a long span. And what we did was some very, uh, we had some different things, and we said, okay, let's embrace failure. We can try things and say some things will fail. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, so we did 
some things we said we have to like focus on our volunteers. We have 400 volunteers and 7,000 participants. Uh, so we're just, uh, for example, we on Facebook as such we we like show the faces of different volunteers and their story, why they got involved, etc. And we always always focused uh, a bit more about uh, on the female part than the male part, and also the female, uh, the women that participated once and then disappeared. We we rang them up and asked why did you disappear? Uh, what could we do to involve you more, etc., etc. And we now reached 25% uh, women. And our next goal is yeah, thank you. And uh, our next goal is like people of color because that's a small part of Norwegian population. But we want the event to actually uh, mirror the entire population. And um, yeah, awesome. Okay. Are we? We have one minute. For that. Okay. Um, so I'll throw up my, this is some info of where you can find uh, the slides, or uh, I wrote a, a quick blog to also solicit comments there if you want to comment publicly. Um, or you can just contact me one way or another. Um, I would love to hear more in-depth feedback or whatever as you, I'm sure, walk away and think about it more. Um, that would be awesome. I'd love to continue the conversation about this because I think it's a cool idea. Thanks. Can I find my slides?